program is recorded live and may feature unexpected moments, sightings, or conversations. Viewer discretion is advised. My name is Alex, and my job is to explore the world around me and take you along for the ride. That's why they call it the jungle, sweetheart. I've guided a lot of adventures and have come to realize that our planet needs us now more than it ever has before. If you don't believe in climate change, you... I've learned it's only going to be through working together that we can restore biodiversity on our planet. Join myself and my friends as we bring you into the tent of conservation and the realm of the wild itself. And along the way, we'll be exploring wild things. Do you want to talk about sustainable seafood? Do I ever! In wild places. Aloha, everybody. Audio is on and everything shut up. Yes, Look I can that. hear you. Yes, it's like a real show, finally. Aloha, welcome back. Um, Get ready, buckle up for another high octane episode of Misguided. Um, glad to see you all again. I hope, I hope you're out there. I hope there's people on the other side of this lens here. Um, if you are there, let us know that you're a fellow human and say hello. Uh, we encourage you to interact with us as often as possible. Um, if you're on YouTube, just want to clarify immediately from the beginning, not a live show. Even though it's all billed as live and interactive, it's only live and interactive on a platform called Mammals, the only live streaming platform dedicated to nature and wildlife enthusiasts, uh, which I hope you are one, especially on today, which is, Jeff, you know this, oh, dark 30 for Earth? Oh, dark 30. Right? It's the, the day that we're all going to shut the lights off in celebration of planet Earth. Uh, so there's a lot to be excited about today, a lot of buzz in the world. I put on my Aloha shirt for the spirit here. I thought, you know what? I haven't worn this thing in probably five years. I'm going to bust it out for this episode. Because we're talking about islands. Uh, when was the last time you were on an island, Jeff? Cool. Uh, Notice uh, they're not a sponsor coming along board. We're just, you know, in the mood. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When was the last um, time you were, were on a tropical man, island? Uh, I was on Maui, I don't know, about four years ago, five years. It's been a while. Yeah. That's, we'll call that recent. Why not? And yeah, I mean, you were there more recently. You were I was, I was you were in Jurassic Park. I was just there uh, in October, which we're going to take a peek at on the show tonight. We're going to mm. transport you, the audience, into my honeymoon. We've edited <laughs> this for for <laughs> for children's sake. Um, <laughs> but tonight's all about island conservation, getting excited about the world around us, but especially these small, unseen worlds that are literally in the middle of oceans, thousands of miles from anything else, and often the most vulnerable landscapes on the planet. Um, our guest tonight, Karen Peterson, tells us that they're quite literally like the canary in the coal mine. These islands all over the planet are the first sign that something is seriously wrong and giving us the chance to actually act upon it. Because by the time you notice it up on the mainland, I think we can say this, shit's got real, man. <laughs> <laughs> shit's got real, real. Um, um, Mom says the volume is very low. Bring that mic closer. Okay, hold up. Also, your mom's here. Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. <laughs> How's that? Any better? Mm -hmm. Straight away. Very, yeah. Excellent. Good. Good. Bueno. Bueno. <laughs> Muchos buenos. Do you have your microphones? I can barely hear you. Oh, I'm just seeing that comment now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we don't have lav mics anymore. Jeff was very pr productive in thinking to get this microphone, uh, which I'm going to get a second one. I probably just blew everybody's ears out right there. Um, this thing is phenomenal. Room. Well done, Jeff. Thank you. That was a great find, great buy, great decision making. It seems to be working a little better than, than the lav mic. It's nice because it's less shit to deal with, you know, it's less to harness Yeah, up and you don't hear the, you know, we kind can of move, you, you know, yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> you know. No good. Anyway, um, again, if you're out there, let us know you're human. Say hello, get excited. Um, I'm going to be keeping tabs on the comments. Jeff, as usual, is back there. He's got all the comments and feeds them to us as we go. Uh, we don't have any live or interactive games that we're going to try to play tonight. Oh, what's up, Jeff? They can hear me now. They can hear Jeff. Oh, my Lord. Welcome to the show. <laughs> it's good uh, to be here. We don't have any, like, interactive games. We're working on 
uh, trying to bring back the cahoots that we played a few weeks ago, and also add in a few other features. I thought it'd be cool if we could find a way to get some buttons that appear on the screen that you guys can like interact with to tell us more what you want to see, maybe without commenting. I'm working on it. It's a, it's a work in progress. Give us some time. We'll get there. Um, but tonight, we are very lucky to have Seacology. Now, Jeff, uh, you, you've met people from Seacology, right? I believe so, yeah. They, uh, uh, I mean, they're based in Berkeley. Yeah. Uh, they've been there since 1991? 91. Um, and they're one of the few NGOs really focusing on island conservation, which yes. makes them very unique. Super awesome. And we are lucky enough to, to have them agree to actually be on this tiny little show, this weird internet fringy thing. Um <laughs> And we were, we were lucky enough to talk to Karen Peterson, so she'll be with us here in just a little bit. I was able to sit down and chat with her last week, actually. Uh, so we have some of that interview that we'll share with you guys. As well as, again, we're going to take you on a trip to Kauai via my honeymoon with my wife in October. Uh, she'll also be on the show tonight. She's uh, baked us another wonderful treat. She tells me that it's ocean-themed. I'm not really sure what that means. And again, tonight I'm kind of excited, actually. When we end the show, which is going to be bordering up on 8.30, um, you know, we, we finish off, we close down, we, we go dark, and then we're going to quite literally go dark. Because if you weren't aware, tonight is go dark for the planet. All around the world, people have been shutting off their power, shutting off their lights from 8.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. local time as a way of showing solidarity for the fact that we all care about our planet. So when we end the show tonight, we are quite literally going dark because for the next hour, we're not going to have any lights on. It's going to be really cool, and I hope that you take advantage of that as well. I hope that you all watching this show support our planet. Uh, I would head outside, listen, hear what you can hear. Hopefully people in your neighborhood are doing this as well. Uh, maybe you'll get a better view of the stars. Maybe you'll hear birds that you're not used to. So we'll have that, uh, not live for you, but uh, our thoughts on it by the next episode. Perfect. I'm just uh, looking at the comments. Uh, again, if you're out there, let us know. Trickle in. Say hello. How are we looking over there, Jeff? Oh, volume's still kind of an issue, but in my headphone, I can hear us fine. So you can pull the main bar up over there. Yeah, I did. Okay. <clears throat> All right, well, we'll play with it. Yeah, just let us know. Actually, here, I'll try. I'm going to assume turning it to the right turns it up. Sure. Which one do you want? Are you on the gain or the, the, oh, on the volume? The master yeah, volume. Yeah, do that. Hello. So soft. You are animated, but not really eerie. That's a problem. Audio is somehow always an issue on this how, show. How? Because <laughs> I, I even just heard in my headphone me closing my sunglasses, so... I can hear it here. Okay. May, may I suggest turning your volume up? <laughs> now yes. good. Okay, we're good. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> anyway. Um, Jeff, take us to the headlines. Okay, headlines. Now it's going to be too loud. Watch. Yeah, probably. I feel like I should have a big, like, mega foot, you know, just shouting. <laughs> um, a lot happening in the news this week. Um, fortunately, some good, some bad, you know, some medium, whatever you want to call it. Um, we're doing a hell of a lot better than the Suez Canal, aren't we, Jeff? Yeah, obviously. You know what's going on there, right? Please tell me you know what's going on. Uh, I did see uh, a little bit of it. I didn't really read the whole thing. But, Giant major uh, cargo ship got stuck sideways yeah. in the Suez Canal, which yeah, is crazy. kind of funny because they're building ships so big now that they don't match up with the infrastructure that we have. So it's like, when is enough enough, guys? Can we just be happy with what we have instead of upgrading everything? Con Can you go more than a day without upgrading the software on my phone, Apple? Anyway, blue whales in the news. Do you have uh, whales up? I do now. Hopefully those are all in there and I remember to do it. Blue Ooh. whales feeding off Chile's uh, North Patagonia coast have to dodge hundreds of vessels daily, most of them uh, serving the area's salmon farms. Um, so, you know, funny enough with the Suez Canal in the news this week, new information out about how our oceans are full of ships constantly. There's estimated about 60,000 ships at any given point in the oceans. We've we've covered this before. It's familiar territory. When we covered uh, Grey Whale Gin, that was about a year ago now. Uh, that's a lot of vessels. Marine traffic in the area is so intense that scientists have described it as a neural network of connections between salmon farms. So just, it's, it's vast, widespread. The various impacts range from collisions, which can result in the death of whales, to noise pollution that prevents the whales from feeding properly. There's a lot of new data out about this. The idea that we're making so much racket that we're drowning out the biophony of the rest of the world and making it harder for wildlife to exist. Uh, animals like whales would be a great first example. Um, 
that's crazy to think that ev I mean it, it goes back to basically physics right Jeff every action has a greater and opposite reaction, reaction. that's that's yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't ever take a physics class <laughs> The various impacts range from collisions, which can... Oh, wait, I already read that one. Um, the researchers behind the study have called for measures to mitigate the vessel traffic intensity and be more mindful of the whales in the area. Now, I don't, I don't really think that's a great solution, if that's all we're going to do. Um, I'd like to see a global assessment of this. Can we figure out how to have more dedicated shipping channels? Can we figure out how to make quieter vessels? Last week, we covered the idea that sailing vessels might be coming back sailing slash electric cargo ships what a game changer something like that would be um, for now though i think we've kind of found out that the diesel stuff petrol isn't isn't cutting it um let's cover something a little bit more positive how, how are you feeling about bonobos um, i'm always feeling bonobos that's feeling your frisky, favorite animal frisky with pan paniscus they are totally right they're so good let me just pop into the comments real quick, see if anybody had any thoughts on Sabrina's that. here. Rachel says loud. Sabrina's here. Hey, Sabrina, how you doing? Um, you heard of uh, the Suez Canal or the, the whale, Sabrina? Because uh, we've been kind of bouncing back and forth quickly on that. You're back to soft again. I, I don't know what to say. Oh, I can hear it fine on that. Yeah, we, we've, got pe we've got people on this. Top men on this. <laughs> Let us know in the comments. What is that a reference <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm, I'm listening to it. I, I can hear it. I'm not really sure what's going on. Uh, bonobos, so let's get into it. Altruism in bonobos. I thought this was too cute to not pass up. Now, if you're not familiar, bonobos are the sex ape, if you will. Uh, great apes come in a few variety. You have humans, you have gorillas, orangutans, <laughs> chimps, and then bonobos, the ones that everybody seems to forget about. Um, bonobos are kind of like chimps. Like, if we break it down a little bit, Chimps are pan troglodytes, if you want to get really fancy. So the genus pan species troglodytes. Bonobos are pan paniscus, so the same genus. They're, they're fairly closely connected. And if this makes you feel comfortable, they share about 98.9% .9 of genetics with you and I, which is super cool. Two wild bonobos uh, in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, were observed to adopt infants from different social groups, according to a new study. These are said to be the first recorded cases of great apes adopting unrelated individuals. While the research, well, aside humans, yeah. <laughs> while the researchers do not know why the bonobos chose to adopt unrelated infants, they speculate that it could be to strengthen current and future alliances within their own groups as well as with other social groups. This is, I think, one of those areas of science and, and Jeff, weigh in here when you like, that I feel like should be a given. Like, I can think of, of examples offhand where I've seen animals adopt other animals in a situation that wouldn't make any sense. Yeah. But also, it's kind of a, a data deficient area. Like, we've never formally studied a lot of this stuff. We've never documented it with science. But I would speculate that there's a lot of just personal communication. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I should give an example or not because it's, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But, yeah, it's, it's kind fine. of, yeah, it is fine. It's interesting. What, what, uh, how many uh, bonobos adopted? Was it just the one pair? Well, apparently it was several over, over a series of time. Interesting. And, and you know, it, it makes sense. I think people like to remove emotion from animals. They like to remove uh, a sense of, of there being an individual in there. And while it's true, I think most animals are basically looking to survive, looking to sustain themselves. I do think they have, depending on their species, the ability to find compassion and, and a sense of belonging with other animals beyond that instinct for survival. Uh, so it's really cool to see that in bonobos, but I'm sure that's been going on for hundreds if not thousands of years. It's just never probably formally been studied. Bonobos are actually yeah. very poorly studied to begin with. Their existence was only made aware to humans in the 1920s. Uh, and that was pretty fringy even then because we didn't even know much about chimpanzees or bonobos because it wasn't until the 60s when Jane got going with chimps. And I mean, bonobos are so recent that I'm sure there's a lot more to learn. Backpedal, let me just see who's been saying what. Tardigrades. Tardigrades are an animal <laughs> I never knew who could live in outer space. And they are adorable. They are. They're tiny water bears. They look like mini chubby bears. I didn't even read that. Um, they are smaller than a millimeter, and they can survive some extreme extreme um, 
with living conditions, which I think is forcing us to constantly readapt our vision of where life is sustainable in the long run. I can't remember what the next one is. Um, fireflies. fireflies. Who here, by show of hands, has seen a firefly? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the three physical people here have. <laughs> Fireflies are super cool, super adorable. Lightning bugs, right? I, I remember seeing those out in the Midwest in uh, Nebraska and Kansas. Um, and then, of course, in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff, bonus points. Do you remember oh, what no. makes the light? It's got to be bioluminescence of some sort. Well, of course. Magic. Magic, <laughs> says Rachel. L Lucy Ferens <laughs> for the win. Obviously. For years, naturalists and conservationists have noted, anecdotally, that fireflies seem to be in decline, but little was known about their conservation status until now. And I've got a little bit of bad news for you guys. An assessment of the extinction risk for firefly species in Canada and the U.S. reveals that 11% are threatened with extinction, 2% are near threatened, and 33% are categorized as least concern, and more than half are data deficient, according to the IUCN Red List criteria. Uh, these numbers are, are up from where they previously were assumed to be. Fireflies need abundant food sources like snails. And I didn't know they ate snails. That's wild. I didn't even read That's this till just now. Crazy. Snails and slugs, plenty of leaf litter in underground burrows, clean water, diverse native vegetation, and dark nights. Protecting and restoring high-quality habitat is critical for the conservation of fireflies and other insects, which are seeing global declines. Now, that isn't really a surprise because... I don't know, Jeff, have you, have you traveled the Midwest much? Um, no, but I'm also still stuck on the fact that they're eating snails and slugs. That's insane to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a weird image. I would have never in a million years guessed that they were I eating never would have guessed that. What but, is uh, this? Why is this? Anyways, no, I, uh, no, I have not traveled the Midwest too much. Um, what would be your vision of the Midwest? Uh, you know, Texas. Texas. <laughs> Which isn't technically it's really not Midwest. even technically Midwest, but that's the first thing that came to mind. Well, I think a lot of this goes back to environmental issue. So I see uh, <laughs> the question of is this because temperature isn't as humid as before? Um, funny you ask that because I was, I, I don't have the, the example up in handy, but I was just listening to a, a, a podcast about how thunderstorms are becoming more prevalent than they used to be, especially in areas where they weren't before, like, get this, Alaska. Oh my lord. You don't think Alaska when you think thunderstorm. Um, and that's because the temperature is fluctuating, shifting, generally getting warmer. So in a lot of sense, it's getting more humid. It's getting hotter. Thunderstorms are more common. Uh, the issue here is environmental. Uh, so Jeff, if you actually wish to do a road trip where we go across yes. the Midwest. Yes. And here's what you're going to see. We're going to drive through California. We'll go up over which mountains? The mountain, the big one. <laughs> yeah, the big one. The Sierra Nevada. There you go. Jesus. We'll go past Tahoe, <laughs> down into the Nevada deserts. Then yes. we'll scream across Nevada. We'll get into Utah, see some cool stuff for a little bit. And then guess what happens? Flat nothingness. Flat and corn <laughs> until you reach Ohio. <laughs> and therein lies your issue. All across the Midwest, the prairies that at one point made this country so impactful environmentally. I mean, just picture the vast rolling prairie with beautiful prairie grass, herds of millions of bison, as far as you can see, gone, all gone and replaced by corn and soy, uh, wheat. Um, and this, this hits a, a very common and prevalent issue, which is that people need to survive. People need to be able to feed their families and sustain themselves. But also, we've kind of destroyed the very thing that allows all that to happen. So there needs to become a balance. We need to figure out a way to make this work. There's conservation groups trying to restore the prairies, which if you restore the prairie, you therein restore the environment the fireflies belong to. And the same could be said of Canada. It's not just, you know, a Nebraska, Kansas issue. Um, you know, are, do you want another dust bowl? <laughs> That's kind of where we'd be headed there. Uh, <laughs> that was a happy turn. That was a really... <laughs> All right, final headline tonight. <laughs> Moving on. God, so happy. What's that title say, Jeff? It says, Can slow food save Brazil's fast vanishing Cerrado Savannah? Cerrado, right. Now, I thought this was tied in 
I decided to make a decent segue. The incredibly biodiverse Cerrado is Brazil's second largest biome after the Amazon. However, half of the savanna's native vegetation has already been lost to, anybody guess? I was gonna say fire. Industrial agriculture. There That's it right, is. kids. That was my second guess. <laughs> and fire, uh, which produce, uh, produces beef, soy, cotton, corn, eucalyptus, and palm oil for export. Now that's almost verbatim, it's the same in the areas we were just talking about. Uh, beef, soy, cotton, corn, right? These are all products being grown where the fireflies live. So it's a pervasive issue, it's repeated all around the planet. Those wishing to save the Cerrado today are challenged by the lack of protect protected lands. One response by traditional communities and conservationists is to help the rest of Brazil and the rest of the planet value the Cerrado's cornucopia of endemic fruits, nuts, and vegetables that thrive across South America's greatest savanna. This is this is another thing that's transplantable all around the planet. Um, when was the last time you had a kelp salad? <laughs> Never. Have you ever had abalone? Have you, have you guys uh, out there, kid, if you're from California, yeah. have you had abalone? We've all had yeah. it here. Yeah. Um, eating foods that are from the part of the world that you live in is arguably one of the best ways you can immediately start to make an impact on the planet. Um, imagine whole forests of, of plants that are potentially even being harvested, um, but they're all native. I think that that's such a possible solution that it's never been fully explored. Yeah. Uh, get back to it here. It disappeared on me. There it goes. I wonder if they can hear the backing up truck. That's what I was just about to check. <laughs> These include the baru and the babasu coconut, the sweet, uh, what is the tricky word? Gabri bo, gabir roba. Spell it out. <laughs> Gab e roba, gabi roba, <laughs> looking like a small guava, um, a type of tomato, the large scaly looking marulo with creamy pulp and strong flavor, the berry shaped mangaba, which means good fruit for eating. So there you go. Uh, the egg-shaped emerald green pekui, and more. All these fruits you've never even heard of. Small family farmers, beekeepers, and traditional indigenous communities, Afro-Brazilian people, uh, socio-environmental activists, and celebrity chefs have become allies in a fast-expanding slow food network, declaring, we want to see the Cerrado on the plate for the Brazil Brazilians and around the world. Uh, absolutely. I think... The whole movement toward foods that were uh, native, putting those on menus, is, is such a cool initiative. I, I would love to see where that could take us. Thoughts, concerns, Jeff? Uh, no, I was making sure we couldn't hear the thing, and good news, we can. So the truck that's annoying over there, no one can hear it. Yes, we can. <laughs> Thank you, Dana. Um, I believe in us. I believe humans got into this mess, and I believe we can, we can figure our way out of it going to take a collective effort on everybody's part to make these uh, a priority uh, it's so easy like i could go get in the car and drive down the hill and do something i never do go to mcdonald's they've made that easy right they put them all over the place they've made it abundantly resourceful for the consumer to immediately have that food but the foods aren't being grown in a productive or sustainable way they're not i mean really Anything at scale is going to be tricky. It's going to be tricky to make that truly a model that can be replicated around the world in a healthy way. Um, but I think it, we, we have to give it a try. We have to give it a try. Um, tell Leo. <laughs> um, I'm sure DiCaprio's got this well figured out. He's, he's, he's a lot more advanced than this silly internet show that we call Misguided. <laughs> Um, with that in mind, uh, in terms of sustainability, when we come back, we're going to have Rachel on the show. She's got a baked treat for us, baked in a sustainable manner. Uh, in the meantime, Jeff, let's take to a break, and we'll see you in about two minutes.
Rachel, welcome. Alex, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, question. Alex, answer. Rachel, how are you doing? Question mark. Alex, fine, period. <laughs> question mark. <laughs> A good question mark, too. Yes. And do you remember exclamation point? <laughs> no. I can't do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next time. Phonetic pronunciation, I think, is important. Wouldn't that be weird to have a whole conversation with somebody where you insert all of that the whole time? Like, I was walking down the street, comma, which would be, and then I saw a moose. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be fun. I think that would be a We're good gonna conversation do a whole to have. Like <laughs> One of these days. Whole segment of misguided. <laughs> um, it's all about islands tonight. It's all about uh, living that tropical life. They're going to see our honeymoon later. Are you okay with that? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah. yeah. It was a good time. It was a good time. It was. Exclamation <laughs> point. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> it. Doesn't work with me. Um, what have you made? Um, I have made a jelly roll cake with uh, like a meringue buttercream frosting. Now, I, I, I doubt most people will get this, but I just hear jelly roll more than when you say jelly roll cake. Um, I feel like a certain accordion plating, playing bearded man right now. That's yeah. fine. Um, what is a jelly roll cake? A jelly roll cake <laughs> is, well, it's a, it's a flat cake that you cook in like a baking sheet and then you make some filling inside, kind of like a, uh, ding, aren't they called ding dongs? Those little yes. butter mm -hmm. rolls. Oh, that thing. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like that, except for I made it in reverse. So I made a vanilla cake with a chocolate buttercream meringue. And then I tried something new, which, Okay, first off, I used a natural, so a natural see. chocolate, or natural, sorry, natural dye, which I found at Safeway, which mm. didn't make it too blue, but it's supposed to be the ocean, and I made, um, There's your the roll. Side. Hold on, hold on. We're getting that okay. stunning shot here. The, the turn. Yes. And then the reveal. On the outside, I made some designs. So you can't really see it real well. This is my first You can try. see that one super well. There's a jellyfish. Well. <laughs> there's fishes on there. And there's starfish, which fish. kind of dissolves. It's adorable. But, yeah, so I, it didn't turn out yeah, as perfect as I wanted. Yeah, there's actually a disease where starfish dissolve. Oh. So it's thematic. It's it works. Fine. It it's works. disease starfish on a jelly roll cake. <laughs> so the designs kind of took a little time. I had to make a different batter, which takes a little bit extra time and a few different ingredients on the chocolate cake and you make those creations on a parchment paper and then you freeze it and then you make the vanilla cake dough batter which um, is like an egg based cake like a sponge cake so you have to whisk up a bunch of eggs for a while <laughs> and they become frothy and thick which is weird because it's basically eggs and sugar and it becomes <laughs> this <just> like <laughs> thick Frothy, custardy thing. How do you like your eggs in the morning? <laughs> Frothy. <laughs> Which you whip up with some flour, some vanilla, and then comes this like foamy batter <laughs> that you lie on top of the parchment paper. Um, That's yeah. a lot of work. <laughs> and then after that, you make the meringue, which is also egg based. So it takes whipping a lot of egg whites for a while and then melting some chocolate and vanilla course there's some sugar in there what well. got you into baking because all i'm hearing is this is a lot of work it's a lot of steps that's why i like cooking meat or fish because it's just <laughs> done <laughs> <laughs> well i happened in college i had some free time in between classes and work so you did what all of us do so i do what all of us do baking. and take up baking <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i took out a bunch of my grandma's cookbooks because um, after she passed we got a whole bunch of her cookbooks and I went through them and I found desserts and stuff and created things mainly from like 1950s cookbooks which is fun but also they have a lot of weird desserts no offense <laughs> I, I saw a recipe a lot the of jello desserts from which... the 20s for a water pie yeah please don't water 
pie? A water pie. But some what? desserts a, are pretty good. A, a, we'll, we'll be the more British. A water pie. <laughs> what the hell is that supposed to be? That If that's the 20s, I'm like, dude, wait eight years for the Depression. Then you're going to need that water pie. <laughs> some water and flour. Oh, we're getting some comments here. Uh, chickens. Um, I would love chickens. to have chickens. I don't know I would love if we to. should in the yard, but I you, used, you've had chickens. Yeah, I used to have chickens and it was wonderful. Like, not only for the eggs, which are great, but like when you had food waste at home, perfect. You just bring it out to the chickens. And it felt so good to just kind of recycle that because you're not just throwing in the garbage, right, you know? Right. And then not only that, like some good fertilizer for, you know, planting them <laughs> in a garden. And, you know, small-scale agriculture like that is, is very human, uh, or at least it has been for about 12,000 years. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think it's, it's, it's a, if you live in certain parts of the city, a cool way that you could start to get renewable yeah. eggs like that and, exactly. and not be as big a contributor to food waste, which yeah. is a huge problem. I, I'm trying to remember the stat off the top of my head, but... I think the WHO says that we're on track by the year 2050 for something like 30% of the world's population to be starving or, or deeply hungry. I mean, wasting food, it yeah. just always makes me feel terrible. Yeah, it's, it's, me too. That's not right. Chickens are, are the solution to what yeah. we're getting at. And uh, I love raising animals. I love animals. To try to circle back <laughs> full, full, full circle here. Yeah. There is an island in the Pacific that you have visited with lots of chickens. Yeah, and it was so nice. This morning I said to Alex, oh my gosh, I missed the sound of roosters crowing in the middle of the day. Cause, or any time <laughs> at all, when we were in this island, there were roosters crowing all the time and it was wonderful. And I said that I missed the sound of zebra pigeons. Yeah, that's that too. <laughs> but the rooster. <laughs> so let, let's, uh, let's give this a go. Let's see what you all get right. here. I have to say, I was slightly disappointed by the batter. It can't be any worse than the milk tart. You're disappointed in something every week, Rachel. <laughs> so are you. I can't help myself. Me. <laughs> no, it's not. So this is a sponge? Oh, you're eating, but this is a sponge? Mm -hmm. Which, it doesn't have a lot of flavor, which is what I'm disappointed by. The meringue has the flavor. Boy, that, that is like eating a sponge. <laughs> they hit the nail on the head by name. <laughs> it kind of has the texture of an angel seed cake. Okay. Everybody at home, everybody on the studio set here, what's your favorite jellyfish? I'm about to eat this jelly. <laughs> Moon jellies are mine. That's a good one. That's good. I, I think you're right. The meringue has great flavor. The sponge, I, I don't know that I've ever really had a sponge cake. That is very spo uh, spongy. It's, it's like eating a sponge. It's not bad. It's, it's just, it's like eating a sponge. You're right. You always have the best comments. You make me feel so good about my pastries. That's treat. my job. <laughs> As host and husband, that is my job. It always makes me feel so good. <laughs> anyway, gang, um, on the theme of island, on the theme of oceans, we're going to send you off now to the island of Kauai, where we had our honeymoon just a few months ago, um, for our musical moment of the week. So Jeff, if you would, whisk Take us away. away. come for a lot of reasons to Kauai. Uh, honeymoon is one. Yep. But I really want to see a honey creeper because it's honeymoon honey creeper at all. It's thematic. Works. And we've heard that they're up in the mountains here. I don't know how well this will show up. Let's try to show you guys. Eh, a little bit. 
never mind, they're mountains. <laughs> We're up here in search of honey creepers, uh, which is a beautiful little red bird with a long curled beak. We've got the big camera with the long lens just in case. So we'll see what we get soon. side of some kind of old like lava tube as you can see it's pretty well this angle makes it look bright but it's it's reasonably dark in here yeah we is. keep stumbling the ground's really uneven but wow it's just crazy to be in this and consider we're in Hanawai uh, where people have lived for a long time yeah. the, the region I was reading is known for lay making and several different uh, royal families of Hawaii came to visit here and stayed here uh, one notably in the 1860s. You read that? Yeah. Yeah, we read. We're smart people. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> decided to do the Nepali Coast Wilderness Trail, and we've gone 0.25 miles. <laughs> How long did it say to, uh, two, two miles would take? Like a one and a half to two hours? One and a half to two <laughs> hours. Uh, if we keep this pace up, I think we'll do the whole park relatively yeah. quickly. Real fast. Real fast. <laughs> I'm not sure if we should feel like we're on Gilligan's Island, uh, Jurassic Park, or Lost. What's your pick? Yeah, it's totally got, I mean, they filmed it here, so it's got that vibe. I can just imagine a dinosaur popping out from Let's hope not, you know? If we bump into Newman from Seinfeld, I think we'll know something weird is going on. Well, what does he eat? Yeah, he gets eaten at the end by the one whose name I can't remember. All right, no honey creeper. We thought we were close there for a minute. Uh, it turns out we probably are in the wrong part of the island for honey creepers. Who knew? Who knew? It's so green and lush. That's why they call it the jungle, sweetheart. Do you guys see why Kona Longboard was appropriate for tonight? <laughs> Man, that uh, that takes me back. That was a solid time. That was, uh, I don't know, such a privilege. Because we were there right when the, the, the restrictions on COVID had eased because you could test into the island and, and you know not skip quarantine effectively uh, if you tested negative for COVID. Um, and we were, we have it on record actually, we were literally the first honeymooners on the island of Kauai, which was kind of cool uh, post-pandemic. Um, and I don't know, the first few days or so was was probably like it was in the 50s and 60s. Nobody, I mean, just, just islanders there. And you had a chance to really see the people who live on the islands and listen to them. Uh, we, we stopped to talk with quite a few and, and really just get to know, to know them and talk about their view of the world, their view of the pandemic, their view of what makes the island special. Um, so for many reasons, that will always be a very special trip to me. On a related note, uh, Karen Peterson certainly is no stranger to visiting islands all around the world and understanding that people who live there often feel very sensitive about protecting those places and are especially vulnerable 
uh, numerous issues, but conservation being one of them. Uh, so I had a chance to sit down with Karen last week and chat. Um, I'm going to be here on standby, so if you guys have questions, I've got the show right here. Um, fire away. If, if something doesn't make sense or you want some clarification, if you just want to point something out, whatever. Jeff and I are here. We're, we're ready to chat with you the entire time. Um, but let's jump to this pre-recorded chat with Karen Peterson from Seacology. Um, thanks again for making some time to, to just chat. I, I, I kind of thought we would chat, I guess, generally about ecology, and I would just kind of put this together later and have it be a co uh, hopefully coherent interview for people to, to watch and okay. enjoy later on. I believe in you. I, that's, that's one of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you tell me any about, I mean, psychology's origins and founding? From, from what I understand, it's, it's got a lot to do with Samoa and cancer research, right? Yeah, yeah. So our founder, co-founder, uh, Dr. Paul Cox, is an ethnobotanist. So he spent time in Samoa, um, especially a village called Thalialupo. And so Psychology's origin story basically has to do with him being in the village and there being bulldozers approaching and the villagers basically saying, well, we can't figure out how else to make money to build a school other than to sell off the logging rights to the village. So um, Dr. Cox and Ken Murdoch, our other co-founder, um, raised some funds and were able to build the school and the forest is now protected and there's a aerial walkway and platform so people can get up into the rainforest and really see it and so that's that's the origin story of psychology um and it was uh, all volunteer organization until 1999. uh in 1997 dr cox and chief fuliano senio from palialupo village who since passed away were co-winners of the goldman environmental prize and so that's how executive director Dwayne Silverstein of Psychology and myself were both working with the Goldman Prize at that time. So we met Paul and it just really resonated with us. Um, and so we became the first staffers of Psychology in 1999. So this marks my 22nd year with Psychology and Dwayne's as well. Fantastic. And so, yeah, so now we're up to 249 projects in 65 countries wow, and that's uh, incredible. protecting 1.4 million acres of habitat. So we work only on islands. Um, we partner with communities that want to protect some part of their ecosystem, be it a coral reef or a mangrove forest, uh, seagrass is important, uh, or a rainforest or other kinds of forest. And we provide some kind of benefit that the community indicates that they need. So it's anywhere from water cisterns to solar power to schools, um, equipment for ranger stations, uh, alternative livelihood is also something we work with, um, providing economic opportunities that work in harmony with nature. Um, so yeah, uh, we, there's eight of us on staff and we have a phenomenal network of field representatives around the world. So they live in these islands, they are from these islands, they, um, you know, they're really connected with the communities and with other conservation efforts. So they're the ones that help us identify the projects and monitor them. And we just couldn't do it without them because we don't want to sit in the US and say, oh, it looks like this community in Vanuatu needs X, Y, or Z, you know, we really want to come from the communities and be what they have identified as a critical need. So that's, that's our basic premise. Um, so that's, that's interesting because at least for me, my background is all in anthropology and I've noticed in, in biology and conservation, there, there tend to not be a lot of anthropologists involved in that work. So what are, what are some challenges that, that would come up with, you're approaching island communities that are particularly sensitive to outsider input and outsider views that must be a significant challenge to even open a discussion what does that process look like for you guys yeah it sure is i mean it, it it's um it's very for me it's it's really humbling because uh, you know you can't any assumptions you make going into these situations will be just blown apart as soon as you're interacting with the villages but um, that's really where our field reps come in to, you know, they establish relationships 
with the villages um, and they are you know deeply connected with the local NGOs we usually will work with local NGOs sometimes that's not possible in some places but um, so they really are our conduit for that for that contact um, and also you know the word just spreads in these communities like in places like we've had a lot of projects in Fiji and the word spreads you know this organization from the US built us a school and you know we're we've got a marine reserve so you know they, they kind of see that it's a really a really good thing and we also try to just keep everything as local as possible and just you know local builders people in the community are in charge you know we really really want to make sure that we're not you know swooping in from the US <laughs> um, but yeah the field reps really make it happen they're sure. they're fantastic they're they're really and they're really dedicated people. We've had some for just about as long as we've been a staffed organization. They've stuck with us because they really, our mission really resonates with them. So nice. So so basically, it's it's trying to grab hold of conservation issues, coral reef degradation, or things, or et cetera, forest loss, and negotiating with communities for things that they actually need that they were going to otherwise get through the the funds coming in from those projects, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not always as, like, Folio Lupo is, it's such a great story because not only is it our, our origin story, but it's also such a, it's a powerful and dramatic story of, you know, being right on the brink and then this chief going after the bulldozers with his machete ch chasing them out of town. <laughs> um, but yeah, and in general, um, our projects just aim to really take pressure off the natural resources. And, um, and again, it has to come from the communities. The communities have to say, you know what, we want to protect this area of mang mangrove forest. And, you know, how do we do it? And they get expertise in country and uh, we provide the funding. So that's, that's how the model works. What would be the most common um, issue that pops up? Are mangrove forests a particularly vulnerable problem that you guys bump into a lot? Well, mangrove forests um, are particularly, I have a mangrove tattoo, so oh, you know fantastic. that's how into mangroves I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, mangroves particularly resonate and, you know, um, and you know, seagrass is very important too, but I've managed, um, I'm our senior manager of special initiatives, so, we had a five-year project in Sri Lanka. That was our largest project ever. Um, that was a mangrove conservation project, and a lot of good things have, have come out of that. Um, but it was really, it was after the tsunami, the Indian Ocean tsunami, um, that it really became clear that communities with intact mangroves fared so much better. They're so much better in the face of severe weather events and climate, you know, driven events. Um, and also just they really help protect the, the biodiversity. Um, they sequester huge amounts of carbon. They're nurseries for reef fish. So for, for communities that depend on fishing, mangroves are extremely important. Um, the mangrove project that we have now, the large, the large countrywide initiative that we have now is in the Dominican Republic. And um, this is a new initiative we haven't really um, really announced it too much yet but it's we're 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 happy to announce it um and it is very different it's more of a almost a it's a public education campaign and it's basically to sort of elevate the reputation of mangroves because people just think of them as these you know a lot of people think of them as smelly mosquito infested swamps and good places to dump garbage and you know, good places to hide drugs if you're bringing drugs into it. I mean, because you know, <laughs> nobody likes to go into them, you know, basically, or very few people know about them. But just the, if, in the DR, there's four mangrove species. There's um, some really amazing mangrove forests, but there's so much pressure, um, as in other places, because of coastal development. So um, we're also doing... Um, some projects with communi within communities where there are mangroves to, to help them develop uh, livelihood initiatives. So, for instance, in one community on the, in the northeast of the DR, um, we're funding 
project that includes um, mangrove beekeeping. Very so, cool. yeah, and the, and so some of the projects are ecotourism based, and of course that's been really challenging in these yeah, I times. Just, I was just about to ask, anything that's tourism based must have taken a huge hit. Yeah, I mean, in some ways it's been, for the newer projects, it's allowed them a chance to really kind of like, I don't know, mend their nets and like, you know, get everything poised and set up so when things reopen, they'll be able to really take advantage of the small scale local tourism. Um, and the DR is, is doing pretty well in terms of their um, vaccination rollout, so we're hoping that things will open up there. Um, before too long, but um, so yeah, we, we are looking forward. Um, we'll be diversifying these projects a little bit to include things other than ecotourism. And but, that, you know, tourism is so huge in the DR. I mean, that's the basis of their I can economy. Imagine. Yeah, yeah. I, and I've bumped into this in so many other places that tourism is such an amazing tool at least for conservation. But over the last year, of course, I've listened to numerous uh, different uh, online meetings where people are basically saying, we don't we don't know what to do because all the tourism is gone. We don't have any other choice. Um, you know, the, the Attenborough phrase of rewilding kind of keeps coming to mind of like, how do you get people to buy into natural places just because it's the right thing to do? You right. know? <laughs> and ultimately yeah, has yeah. a trickle down effect of it's it's going to benefit everybody, the wildlife, the people included when you protect these wild places. That, that's that must just be an unbelievably uphill challenge right now to to negotiate with people that there is no tourism, but we still have to do this simply because it's the right thing to do. Right, right, yeah, exactly. But we've got an awesome project partner called Grupo Jaragua in the DR, and you know we're just really excited because this is a, for us it's very different. There's a lot of emphasis on social media and really creative ways of of outreach and um, education. So. So that's our current large project, but we're also starting to focus more on seagrass because, you know, seagrass is incredibly important as well. Um, Could you elaborate a little more on that? I, I mean, I'm, I'm, the ocean is something that I'm attracted to and I think it's beautiful, but I admittedly don't know a whole lot about it. And I'm sure the audience is <laughs> in a similar position. Um, could you elaborate Yeah, on seagrass? Yeah, so seagrass is another uh, coastal resource that is, you know, it's, um, I think a lot of people are who are familiar with seagrass might associate it with manatees, um, which is true, but they're an important um, carbon sink as well. So it, like mangroves, they're incredibly important for carbon sequestration. But there's a lot of damage that happens with um, particularly boat anchors. Um, and there just isn't a ton of knowledge about seagrass. So um, we've got a handful and they're growing more um, seagrass projects, uh, including one in Washington State, one in um, one in Wales, uh, and a couple other places. So that's something we're just kind of ramping up a little bit more as, as people find out more about how important um, seagrass is for carbon sequestration, but also for, for coastal species like mangroves. So. I'll be curious, I just saw a report about a week ago that said the California kelp forest has all but shrunk and disappeared. I uh, saw that too. That was really disheartening. I'll be curious to see additional reports that elaborate on what they mean by that or if there's yeah. any projected return or, or what's what's ultimately gonna happen to the California coastline. I yeah, think it, it's hard to be, um, it's hard to maintain optimism, but you know, if you believe in science then, uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I saw that report as well. And, and you know, the good news is that there is, I mean, how much is too little too late, but I feel like there's a really strong push now for protected, area, protected areas of all sorts. Um, so we'll see, but we just keep, you know, trudging forward. I mean, we've actually, during the pandemic, we've actually, I'm amazed at how well Seacology has done in terms of keeping things going with our projects and our project partners continuing to to do the work and our field reps continuing to do the work. So that's been really heartening. Um, but it's also been really interesting to, um, you know, th there's this, I'm going to show my age now, but there's such an awesome group of young climate activists coming up and that gives me a lot of hope. So that, that always encourages me as well. I think 
I think one thing is clear that young people really seem to inherently get there's a problem. I don't think they always understand what it is or they don't understand the science fund it, but I really think young people seem to understand there's an issue that's not going to go away and it will impact our lifetime. Um, so I mean, I go out, well, pre-pandemic, I would go out and do school programs a lot, or I still do like virtual school things and interact with people. And I, I still very much see in, in kids even just this excitement and wonder and curiosity and, and eagerness to do anything, which gives me yeah. hope every single day, definitely. Exactly, yeah. Where, where do you hope psychology goes or what, what would be like the perfect world according to psychology? What would that look like? I mean, the, the great thing about psychology is, you know, everything's so scalable. Like we have one kind of project that works really well in one particular kind of ecosystem. And then you look at another place where you could, it could be replicated and be equally effective and equally powerful for the communities. So it's just kind of, I mean, I get that question a lot and it's kind of like, just more of the same. I mean, more countries, more islands, um, you know, more deeply threatened habitats, um, more just ways for communities to, um, to be able to really coexist with their environment without having to sacrifice it for economic reasons. Um, so really more of the same. And we're also, um, I talked about Sri Lanka and the Dominican Republic, you know, we're, we're slowly taking on some larger projects that um, are quite a, quite a bit larger in scale than our classic projects. But I do think it's just kind of more of the same, more field reps, um, just in, increasing our global reach. And field reps, I mean, in, in the anthro world, that would be like a community informant type character. How does a relationship like that get started? Do you guys have to reach out and start fishing, I guess, to use a theme yeah, term for people yeah. that are interested in this? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's basically it. We just start poking around and contacting local organizations and seeing who's out there and seeing who um, is a good fit and, um, you know, someone with a lot of good connections and also just deep integrity and um you know, love for island environments and cultures, basically. So we, um, I can't remember how many we're up to now, but it's got to be around 30. Um, but yeah, they're, it's a pretty amazing group of people. And that's kind of been one of the little silver linings about the pandemic is they've been able to participate remotely in a couple things that they wouldn't be able to in person. But um, but yeah, they are really key. We just could not, we could not do this without them. And one of the questions that, that the viewers ask me a lot or kids will ask me when I'm out doing programs is, well, what can I do to help? And I've always thought that's such a ridiculous question, but in the right best possible frame of mind, because it's hard to answer, what can I do to help? So I'll ask the ridic ridiculous question of what, because <laughs> people are going to ask, you know, what can they do right. to help? Because, you know, I, I would, I would hazard a lot of the viewers of the show haven't even really considered like island conservation being being a thing i mean I, they've thought of right. conservation they've probably considered a few islands but that are, there's groups dedicated to that so people here or wherever they're watching from what action could they take to, to try to benefit island conservation well you know that, that is that's a, always a such question. a hard question yeah. yeah and it's true that for for a lot of people islands aren't really relatable um and uh, it was actually a big leap for me because I was more of a kind of a grassroots, you know, stay in your own backyard kind of person until I started with ecology. But I mean, 80% of species extinctions in the past 500 years have occurred on islands. Um, you know, they're just, they're the canaries in the coal mine. And in terms of climate change, they're certainly on the front line. So, I mean, I always just go to, the bigger picture, like what what can you do in your personal life to reduce your impact? Right. And it's something I really I cringe when I say it because like 
two years ago, I traveled over 140,000 miles <laughs> <laughs> of air travel, you know, like my right. carbon footprint is like a size, you know, 25. But, um, but really, that's, you know, it's the personal choices. And it's also like getting involved, getting involved with, there's so many great, um, you know, groups going on now that, that in so many, you know, this, this pandemic has forced us to to network in new ways and there's so much exciting stuff happening. There's a group I'll give a shout out to called Island Innovation and um, they are doing such a fantastic job in um, connecting islands and islanders over conservation and climate issues during this time. Um, so, you know, find out about these organizations and dive in and educate other people, you know. Donate to Seacology. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, <laughs> and, and I guess just to kind of piggyback off that when people travel again, when they are moving again, um, I, you know, I'm thinking about this because I, I was just in Hawaii a few months ago. We were there at that perfect little window where the world allowed for a little bit of travel. And I, I couldn't help but look at the islands and kind of think to myself, you've got this wonderful little, you know, ecosystem that's out here in the middle of the ocean. Um, I, it was interesting to learn more about the indigenous Hawaiians, to learn more about how various different plants have been brought there. The uh, what is the two term for them? The I think they're called canoe plants mm -hmm. that were brought via canoe. So thinking about islands changing over time, and now we have almost this approach of, well, you need to protect all of it and leave it as is in situ, and that's debated and conflicted. So as a tourist going somewhere. Um, are there any tips or actions or things people can do and remember to not damage these environments, not be part of the constant problem, but also try to recognize landscapes change over time. That's that's a normal part of, you know, the Earth cycle. Sure, and you know, it's certainly not not right to expect islands to just be preserved in you right. know, gelatin or something. Um, right. But I mean, for me personally. I just do as much research as I can in terms of trying to be a, a low impact and sensitive traveler. Um, it gets a little tough. We get a lot of requests from people who want to go into the communities where we work and volunteer. Ooh, and we don't a have a, course. yeah, we don't have a volunteer program and we, we can't, we're just too small. We can't manage it, but it's also very tricky to just plop somebody in some really small village and expect them to be, you know, cared for and all that. And I mean, there are organizations that do it and do it splendidly, but right. just, it takes so much sensitivity to not make it be more <laughs> of a burden than a help. Um, so, and that doesn't really answer your question at all, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, fine, it's, it's dynamic. We're going with it. Uh, I just kind of, you know, I just, I am so spoiled personally because I get to go to these remote places and I can't, I can't survive an hour like in Waikiki or a place like that. Oh, no. um, but basically, yeah, just, just, just finding out what the, you know, keeping the, the tourism dollars you're spending as local as possible and supporting on as grassroots of a level as you as you can, um, I think is really important. Um, Would you say that there's a welcome, uh, a sense of welcoming from from most communities to see outsiders, even as just tourists? Or we we yeah. we traveled to the uh, north shore of Kauai. We were in Hanoi, so oh, about as far away from people as you could get. Because I really just wanted to be in a completely natural surrounding, and we spent tons of time on the Nepali coast. And, you know. So just get away from it all um, yeah that's that's one of my favorite places that is really yeah. a beautiful place um yeah. sorry <laughs> your question. Um, interview, karen you nailed it <laughs> <laughs> no it's, it's, it's great this, this is content you can only find on misguided <laughs> <laughs> perfect <laughs> um how did i phrase that again it was it was just um Oh, how are people welcoming or? Yeah, because or, or people. we definitely saw in, in Hawaii in particular, I think you get this fun divide of tourists loving a place to death and then mm -hmm. the locals, especially the Polynesian locals, really kind of having this split sense of they either 
are largely kind of indifferent or totally don't want outsiders around. Uh, right, right. Yeah, I mean, and that's the tricky bit. It's so hard to know going in. And I've had, I've had the full gamut of experiences where, but it's different, you know, because I'm coming in as a potential fund, you know, representing a potential funder. So they're, you know, it, it's, which is very awkward for me, um, you know, uh, but, but, uh, yeah, there's been the full range and you just have to respect that, you know, it's really, it's, it's really a big deal for some of these communities to have outsiders come in. And so we just have to be really respectful of that. Um, but yeah, just, I mean, I'm a compulsive researcher of island communities. And so I just try to like, like to try and go in knowing as much as I can, and then just go in with like, just let your ego fall away. Um, you know, just, I've just found that being a kind person and being respectful is the most important thing. And that's why I do what I do, because I mean, I have an interesting, my career path has been very interesting. And so it's been based a lot on this kind of, you know, going into something wide open, with eyes wide open and just taking it in and just synthesizing the best I can, but just staying as respectful as I, as I can be. Yeah, it brings to mind um, Anthony Bourdain, you know, who had the numerous series, uh, yeah. has a quote about winging it when it comes to travel, not making too mm -hmm. many plans and just kind of going with the flow and meeting people mm -hmm. and having meals at someone's house and just being present where you are. Um, yeah. Even if I think you're not going <laughs> to take the time to do the research, which I hope people read about where they're going, but, yeah. you know, just being present, I think, makes all the difference, not having too, too many expectations. Yeah, and not being, um, I mean, for me, the biggest thing is overcoming the self, the, the what do I want to say? The kind of um, internal chatter that keeps you from really, really connecting with people um, and just not being nervous about just, you know, try to relax and try and just take it in because it's such a gift. It's such a gift to see the way other places in the world, you know, function on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's, it's really humbling. I mean, yeah, it's amazing. Well, I won't uh, keep you too much longer unless you had any, any other thoughts or things you wanted to share or, or, or add on. But I, I just think what you guys are doing at Psychology is amazing because it's so unique uh, comparatively to other conservation programs. It's, I don't know, it feels very targeted in, in a lot of ways. And, you know, like we were just saying, very connected to people themselves, whereas I think a lot of other groups, just they take a different approach, a different style, and that's, that's fine. But I've always admired Psychology for how you guys approach people and especially the idea that you're working on islands that's like who's doing that that's incredible well thank you yeah it's it's pretty amazing i just feel so incredibly fortunate to have kind of come upon this as as a career and obviously 22 years in i'm <laughs> yeah, you must like I'm, it. <laughs> I'm pretty into it i you know I, I i we're based in california but i moved to colorado six years ago um i'm a trail runner so this is kind of like the trail running mecca of the universe for me that's right you, and, um, you were gonna um you were training for a race right yeah i'm training for a 25 miler in cool. uh may that is very very difficult very lots of elevation gain but um but I just, you know, I love it. I just stay out there all day. I don't care about my time. As long as nobody pulls me from the course because I'm too slow, it's all good. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I've been working remotely for six years. And uh, so I've been helping my, my coworkers adjust to the reality of working from home. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, hopefully we'll all be able to get out, back out into the world again soon. In the meantime, I think we'll probably all be a little bit more grateful and a little bit more humble so yep i think we can finally legitimately see the light at the end of the tunnel and i'm hoping that at the end of the pandemic everyone's kind of had some time to realize what we all lost during the pandemic yes and when we get through it have a refreshed sense of we're in this together and you know, we have this one beautiful planet and we need to respect it because ultimately the pandemic was the result of a breakdown in conservation that's <laughs> we right all paid that's the price. Right. 
yep, yeah. yep. That's that's my hope as well. I got my first vaccine yesterday, so congratulations. Yeah, I still you. can't get an appointment, so we'll keep winging yeah. it until then. <laughs> <laughs> um, man, Karen was such a font of knowledge. She, I mean, she's seen and done it all. There's no other way to put it with psychology. Uh, she's traveled to so many different islands. Like she said, they had, what, over 280 projects currently going? Yeah. Or that they have worked in? Uh, just astronomical what psychology has done and what they've crafted out. And, again, they're really working on such a niche area, island conservation, which gets overlooked so often. I never really considered it. So I happened to meet um, some folks from Psychology. Actually, this is fun. His name is Michael Scott. <laughs> Stop. Um, when I met Michael Scott from Psychology uh, at a, a conference that I was at. But um, how cool it is to think that there are groups out there that have taken up that mantle and really connected the dots that kind of like the unofficial tagline of the show, which I've just realized is also a World Wildlife Fund thing people, places, wildlife. I think that's at the core of it all. I think that's really at the heart of how we're going to address major issues across the planet. Cool. I'm just double checking that the audio is actually on. Beautiful. <laughs> Pull that a little bit closer. Is my head now blown out? No. No, you're good. Excellent. It just, I felt really far away. Um, well, that's, that's about all the time we have, guys. I'm just looking to see if we have any last minute comments poking around here. Pull that back up. Looks like you're the last comment from the way I live. Beautiful. Um, if you're on YouTube, again, keep in mind the show obviously wasn't live. Um, you can join the fun. You can get in on the action by signing up at www.mammals.com. And you can find my page to search for my name, Alex Coburn. And you'll be able to find the whole show of Misguided Catalog there, as well as a lot of other posts. Uh, or on Instagram, uh, Mis Misguided Guide. Uh, or obviously on YouTube, if you found the page here. Um, this show is what you guys make of it. Uh, get involved. Let us know what you'd like to chat about, what you'd like us to cover. We're almost at the end of what we call Season 2 um, next time on Misguided. So this is actually going to get a little bit weird, guys. Next week, uh, we're going to take a, a brief break. Um, I don't know what we're going to stream next week, actually. I'll figure It's not going to be a formal show. It's going to be something weird and easier to manage. But it's a holiday weekend. I've got stuff going on. I just It's too hard to put together a whole show. So our final episode of season two will be the week after on April 10th. And we are taking a trip to where Jeff comes from, <gasps> south of the border. <gasps> We're going to Mexico. Yeah. So, not literally, I, I'd like to visit Mexico, but I don't have the time right now. Um, we're gonna get into recycling um, with Catesville Ecology um, and my good friend, Sean, who founded the nonprofit Catesville Ecology uh, to talk about his work to support uh, villagers in Mexico through recycling programs in California. Very cool. Um, but that'll be April 10th. Um, again, next week, April 3rd, we're going to just, I don't know what, we're going to stream something strange. We'll figure it out. Don't worry about it. Our problem, not yours. In the meantime, I think it's worth mentioning um, tonight is a World Wildlife Fund sponsored night all around the world. Um, a night where we celebrate our planet. We celebrate the, the idea that we are potentially polluting it in a way that we don't think of very often. We're polluting it with light uh, and power consumption. So World Wildlife Fund invites us to join Earth Hour from 8.30 to 9.30 p.m. tonight, uh, March 27th. Uh, shut off your power, shut off your lights. Unless you need it for like life support reasons, that maybe keep it on. Um, 
shut off your lights at the very least and join the fun by going dark with all of us to enjoy uh, our our planet and the sights and sounds of the nighttime. So Jeff, what do you think? Are we we're gonna we're gonna join Earth Hour, right? Absolutely. I think it's it'd probably be a shame if we didn't. We can't we can't live stream it because we won't have power. That's right. Um, but that's fine. We'll figure it out as we go. We're just gonna sit here in the dark and drink. It's gonna be great. Oh yeah, it's gonna be great. Um, all right, guys, let's try that again. Oh, let's no. <laughs> oh, God. Hang on. What is happening? Did it shut oh, off? Oh, we were getting all sorts of things. No, I think it's still going. I think we're good. <laughs> all right. Well, with that in mind, let's try that one more time. Let's shut off the power. <laughs> I can hear myself. <gasps> We're here. Do we have Earth Hour up? Uh, yes. The thing says it's on. Aha! There we go. Boom. Earth Hour. All right. Then when you're ready, you're, you're the only one they can hear now. Go ahead and close out the show. I get to close out the show. Go for it. Oh my God! I've never done this before. I don't know what to say. It's very exciting. Thank you, everyone, uh, for watching and uh, enjoy Earth Hour. We'll see you next time.